Second Chronicles 29. Hezekiah, he's uh, one of the great kings of Judah we're going to read about. As I said, this is Judah. Chronicles records the Judah kings, the ones that are in the line of Jesus Christ. There are good ones and there are bad ones. But Israel, you can't find one good one. Hezekiah is one of the great ones. Began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. So that tells you right there, all right, we're already on a good step with him. He, in his first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, under the Schofield Bible, this, from, chapter, uh, from verse 3 all the way down to 19, is called a revival. So, if you want a revival, this is what you're to study. Let's read what Hezekiah Hezekiah, he's going to go all the way to chapter, uh, he goes to chapter 32. You got to read these, these, these chapters and study them if you want the revival. But we are talking about Old Testament, a nation that is God's. A place where God said he will call his name is now where in America. I mean, God sent the pilgrims here, yes. But this nation is not God's. It's not the apple of God's eye. Americans are not God's people. The Jews are. Israel is the land. America wasn't even known until 1492 or the Vikings. So the first thing you got to do is you got to open the door of the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. This is where God said he will be. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered, to get, gathered them together in the East Street. All right. All priests are Levites. All Levites are not priests. You can't gather the priests today. There are no priests. Though in Revelation 1, uh, Jesus says that uh, we are priests and kings. So if you want to spiritualize it, yeah, we are priests and we are kings. And said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites. Sanctify now yourselves. Alright, so the first step in revival is you got to set apart yourself. You got to be holy. That means you get all the junk out of your life. You as an individual has to get the junk out. You have to put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ today, 1 John 1, 9. you got to clean up your life and say, I'm going to live for God. That's the first part of revival. And sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. All right, you got to get the junk that's in the church house that does not belong there. The Olson books, the, the Bibles that are not King James Bibles that's laying around. The, the things that are not scripture. Everything that's worldly. Everything that is dedicated to another God needs to be removed. Everything that can't give God the glory, but gives glory to something else, needs to go. And carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. What more can you get in that? The filthiness, the junk, the garbage, the doo-doo. You got to get it out. Get it out of the holy place. Well, you can't do that because, because everyone's welcome in the church today. Show me where Paul brought sinners into the church. No, he dealt with them on the streets. 
He went into the, the, the synagogues where they were lost. The synagogues was not the, not the Christian's church house. If you read the book of Acts. They went house to house, fellowshipping, breaking bread, and, and talking about the doctrines of Christ. But you show me where they brought lost people into the church house and let them stay. If you had proper preaching every week, those sinners would, would not want to be there or they would get right under the Holy Spirit conviction. Imagine an unsaved person feeling, feeling good where a bunch of Christians are, feeling good where the Holy Spirit is supposed to be. That they're not under conviction. About your life. For our fathers had trespassed. Now for the Jews it's true. I mean we've been reading all the way. You know from Solomon. David. Saul. Abraham. Isaac. Jacob. We're all sinners. You gotta acknowledge that you and your past are sinners. And done that which is evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. And today, if you read Revelation chapter 3, the church says, We're increased of goods, we've got this, we don't need you, we're rich. We're... And it's lying to itself. You're not gonna get no revival with that kind of attitude, especially when God says you're naked, poor, and rich, and miserable. Revelation chapter 3. You can't have a revival when you're lying to yourself. Imagine having a revival week after week after week and you, and you stand under a false scripture. Sorry, I'm called to speak the truth. And turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord. And that temple has been closed. Been shut up. It's been, you know, the gold taken down. The things broken up. And all that. Only in the Old Testament can you find where you're to go to a building to worship God. Only in the Old Testament. Yet, yeah, but how often did Jesus spend his time in the temple? Where did Jesus have a church building? I can remember one time he was he, his, a, a ship was his pulpit. I can remember a desert ground was his pulpit. I can remember a well was a pulpit. When all the people, and the woman went and got all the people to the city, where did he go? He stayed right there at the well. On a dirty ground where he wrote with a finger was his pulpit. The temple, the building is Old Testament. It's the house in the New Testament. People who gave their homes. Because you couldn't worship openly under Nero. And have shut up the doors in the porch and put out the lamps. Well, that happened back in Samuel's time under uh, Eli. And there the Bible says, and there the lamps went out. The dark ages, where no one had a Bible. Because the church kept them illiterate. They couldn't read it. I wonder how well a, a, a grade 12 person just graduated this month out of the public school system, I wonder how well he can read. How about in five years? How about in ten years? Sure don't want you reading the Bible. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Well, if I remember correctly, I think it was last night, wasn't Ahaz burning incense everywhere? 
He wasn't burning it to God. We talked about well last night and night before we talked about you know incense you can burn to smell to make your house smell good. Incense is a t and the, the smell the Bible speaks of it as a Christian in their prayers. When John the Baptist's father was in the temple ready to burn the incense, the people out are outside in prayer. It represents prayer. It's that it's that article that's in the temple. And this is going to be a long one. It's that article that's in the temple that was either it was in the holy place or if you look in other place, it was in the most holy place. Well, where was it? It comes from where the lamp was, and it comes from where the bread is at the table. You sit down and read the God. It comes from you, and it goes into the holy place before God. And when you offer the wrong kinds of prayer, you get a spot on your forehead. It's called leprosy. It's a disease. And God did not receive Uzziah's prayer. Does God hear the prayer of those that are lost? No. How could you, how could he hear your prayers when you re reject Jesus Christ? God is under no obligation if you reject his son. Well, this happened. Yeah, Jesus said, it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. Cornelius' prayers came up, but God knew what he was going to do. He knew he was going to be obedient. He knew he wasn't going to worship that, that angel. See, God already knows. God knows what your conduct is. There, listen, people on television today, they'll sit down and they'll pray, you know, as part of the script. You think God hears that? The TV uh, family program that I know, the Waltons, you know, they sit down at the table and pray, and you know, and then Grandpa will go down and drink moonshine or go down to the whorehouse. Or the two ladies that make moonshine. You think God's appreciate those prayers? How about every TV program or movie where they get a guy gets up in a pulpit, you know, he preaches and he, you know, they all pray and sing praises to God. You think God accepts that? As for Cornelius, God already knew what he was going to do. Cornelius was seeking and searching when seriousness. Cornelius wanted to know the way, the truth, and life. Then God's obligated to answer. But when you continue to reject God, your prayers are not going to be heard. Not to praise Lord, you know, stop these storms. Oh, Lord, I need money. Not that. But if your prayer is for Jesus Christ, for you to receive him as your Savior, God will answer that prayer. He's obligated to. Jesus said, Thou shalt seek me, thou shalt find me. Realize there, there's tons of prayers going up today, and they're just meaningless. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and we just read about all those wars before uh, Israel come down, and uh, the Philistines had come down, and Edomites had crossed over, and, and he delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, to hissing. As you see with your eyes. Now trouble is problems. Astonishment. That's why I can't believe what's going on in my life. I just, just total chaos. Hissing. You know, people are looking at you. And that's, and that's, a, that's some kind of, of, of hissing. is some kind of thing. Oriental custom. It's like, it's cursed be you. Is you know, you're, get away from me. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, war. Our sons and our daughters 
Our wives are in captivity for this. And we read yesterday where Ephraim came in and actually took captives. But God went and spoke to him by Obed and they released him. But the Philistines still came in. The Edomites still came in. Assyria still came in. There were captives during them. There was a point that we read in, in yesterday with the king. They, you know, his house was just, uh, was taken. His uh, the house of the Lord was taken. They killed one of his sons, if not sons. Then they took the next onto the king and killed him. Other chaos. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. You, in order for revival, is in your heart. You've got to make an oath, make a bond with God to do right. And nothing else. That even when you fail... And you sin, because we're all sinning, it is going to be in bitter and agonist that you've done it to God and against God only. That your spirit will be broken, that your heart will be contrite. You're very serious about your sin, you're not playing with it. It bothers you that you have done it before God. My sons, be now, now negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that ye should minister unto him and burn incense. He's still talking to the priests, he's still talking to the Levites, and he's telling them, you're going to stand before God. You're to serve God. And you're going to minister on him, and you're going to burn that incense, what God wants. There's been so much incense burning he's seen by his father for everything and everything but God. Like I said, incense is all for a prayer. The most serious prayer God will hear is when you want a savior. Then the Levites arose, Manahath, the son of Mashai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, the sons of the Kohites, and the sons of Merari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehaliah, the of the Gershonites, Joel, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joel, the sons of Elzvasphan, Shimari, and Jeriel, the sons of Asaph. Zechariah and Mananiah, and the sons of Heman, Jehiel and Shimei, and the sons of Jejutheth, Shimea and Uzel. And they gathered their brethren, this is the Levites, and sanctified themselves, and came according to the commandment of the king, by the words of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. A revival in your church is other people are going to follow and listen to the pastor. If you want to apply it to the church, they're going to clean up their lives. They're going to want to do right. They clean their lives up totally, not half-heartedly. They don't walk warm. They walk hot. When the, when the revivals did go through America, man, they shut down pa uh, package stores. They shut down bars. Billy Sunday had the alcohol industry uh, all up, in, all up in arms, all up in, in anger. They, they tried to have him killed. When, when a man would sin, he would hide. Not today. And I'm talking about the church house. I ain't talking about unsaved people. There's open sin in the church. And to cleanse the house of the Lord is cleansing yourself and cleansing the, the, the house. The, the, the Corinthian says the temple is, is our bodies. 
How can you clean your, your, the body that the Lord's given you and, and be a Christian? And I have people come up to me in the streets now and say, See, look, I'm a Christian, and they show you a Christian tattoo. That's not cleaning your body. When God tells you you're not to make marks or print any things on your body. And you get these stupid sports people, and these stupid idiots, they're going out there and marking their bodies for Jesus. And the guy's own mother, when I got my, it calls him an idiot. You want a revival in America amongst Christians, and they're not clean up. Matter of fact, they're they're making complete opposite of their body, the temple, according to Corinthians. I thought you're supposed to put the word in your heart, not in your body. The guy there says, "I'm a Christian tattooist, and I'd rather go to hell than not do this for." Yeah, you're going to hell. You've been deceived. And the news people said, well, what about it says order Leviticus print mark? I know about that verse. Everyone throws it at me. Because they're trying to tell you you're wrong. And I believe a lot of those people are not Christians. But there are Christians out there doing things in their body, doing things in their home, doing things in their lives, and it's not cleaning. It's anything but. And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. Alright, notice how the priests go in. No one else can go in there. So when John the Baptist's father goes in there and sees Gabriel. And then Gabriel says, because you have not believed me, you're going to be silent until the baby's born. He knew that it had to be an angelic being in there, because no other man could be in there unless he was a priest. You keep seeing the revelation there? That's why John the Baptist's father was given the silence. There was no one else that could have walked into this place except it was a priest. And John the Baptist's father was a priest. All right, now watch that. And the Levites took it and carried it out abroad to Brook Kidron. They, the priests go in. The Levites are standing outside the the, the temple, outside the holy place. And the, and the priests give them say, "Get this junk out of here. Take it to the junkyard." And then the Levites step in. They're in the court. They're allowed in the court, but they're not allowed in the most, in the most holy place or the holy place. And that book, Kidron, if you study in the Bible, that's where they throw all kinds of junk in there. Everything in the junk ends up. That's the, that's the, the, the false religion junkyard. Now, whether your church where you meet, or you as a Christian, your body, your home, your car, your family, have you got stuff that's unclean in the temple? That needs to be taken to the junkyard. That nobody else is, but the Bible says in Revelation 1, we're priests. The only place that you can go in and nobody else. Can you remove that garbage? Are the skeletons in the closet under the blood? Now they began the first day, the first month to sanctify. And on the eighth day of the month. They came to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. And in the sixteenth day of the first month, they made an end. Fifteen days to clean. That's a mess. Of junk. Taking everything out to the, to the junkyard, to the garbage. But they made an end. They, they did it to the end. They were complete in their life. Everything that did not belong in God, it's filthiness. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, 
We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. All the house. They didn't leave us a, a, a secret closet. They didn't put it into, you know, that one sin into a locked chest. All the house. And the altar to burn offering. That's in the courtyard. Listen, not just not just the body they clean. They clean the courtyard too. With all the vessels thereof, everything involved. And the showbread table. And all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression. Have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. All right, so Ahaz got rid of stuff, but he didn't completely get rid of it. They went back and got wherever it went, and they sanctified it, they cleaned it, they prepared it. In other words, they rededicated it back to God. Is there something in your life that was God's, and you just took over? Or you just threw it off somewhere there for a while? And it just got lost? And it's still laying on a pile somewhere? Something that you gave to God? Is it time to bring it back? And to prepare and sanctify it? It's about cleaning, renewing, and getting everything back. All those oaths you told God in your lifetime. You know, you will be, you will be under the oaths that you told God. By God, I do this, or I swear, I do, or Lord, if you get me, you know, and Lord, if you do this, and Lord, if you, I will, I will, I will. So help me, God. And the sins in your life. When you go up to the person that you sinned against, and you confess that sin to them, that's a humbling experience. That, that's a revival. Imagine going up to somebody and saying, listen, I stole from you, or I lied to you, or I embezzled you. I said stuff to you I really didn't mean. That's what we're talking about in revival. That's what we're talking about. We're getting back with God and doing what God wants to do and having that sweet fellowship again. And Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. Okay, now we've done the priestly work. We've done the Levite work. That, that part of our lives that, listen, you know, we want to be priests to other people. We want to tell other people what to do. What about our own lives? Have we cleaned up our lives? You know, the beam that's in our eyes, but we want to look at the people in the moats in their eyes. All right? Now, if we got that part of our life cleaned up now. The priestly part of our life that our smell before the Lord is a seek is a sweet smell. And our prayers, our, our incense is, is only God prepared with no one else to make a composition like it. And we're to offer those prayers up to God in that burning. And we bring in that, that sacrificial, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world, that one sacrifice, the blood of Jesus Christ without spot. And when we bring that in to the most holy place. That's what God loves. If we've done that, you can't re-offer Jesus Christ, but you can keep on applying the blood. Now we're going to work on the rulers. What are those things that rule in our life? What are those things in our life that, that you know, has denominus, tells us what to do? And gathered the rulers of the city, went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bullocks, seven rams, and seven lambs, and seven he goats for a sin offering for the kingdom. Those things that rule your life that tell you what to do, is it do you bring the offering before God? Do you confess it as a sin offering? Lord, I have not been able to get control of this. Lord, I bring it to you as a sin offering. It is ruling my life. It is ruining my life. 
It is this thing that is hampering the relationship between you and me. It's a sin to do what I'm doing. And yet I have not got the victory yet. That I am still in the flesh. And Judah, and commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. You're the priest. You don't have to go to a priest. You're a priest. Are your sins, have you brought your sins into the most holy place and pled the blood of Jesus Christ? Listen, I had a sin the other day. The Lord was dealing with me when I was laying in bed a long time ago. And I wasn't sure if it was done before or after I was saved. Now, it was done before I was saved. It was done before April, April 21st, 1987. It's under the blood. But I wasn't sure if it was done before or after. And I put it under the blood. It was a long, 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 long time ago. And I forgot all about it. But when you tell the Lord, when you say, Lord, and this is what a lot of Christians don't want to do. They don't dare do what is it, the sin in my life that's hindering our fellowship? What am I doing? What have I done in my life that's not under the blood? Now, you've got to be careful because the devil will come in and bring up sin that is under the blood. If you know it's under the blood, listen, that's Satan. And you're sure that you confessed it. It's washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You tell Satan, say, listen, I don't need to remember that no more. Because according to 1 John 1, 9, God forgot it. Now, get out of my life. I got a real issue with God. Sin that is in my life that's unconfessed. And if you're serious with your heart about that, you watch God come into your life and tell you those sins that are not under the blood. Like I said, like I had the other night, I, I had to, wasn't really sure. And I said, Lord, if this was under the blood, I'm sorry. I don't remember when this happened. If it's not under the blood, I need to confess it and put it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and get on. Lord, if it's already under the blood, then you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if I were to die right now, if this sin is not under the blood, it's going to be revealed before everybody the judgment seat of Christ under the blood. It's forgiven and forgotten now. Done. That's one little mark in my life that's cleansed and gone. I didn't have to bring it to a priest in a phone booth to tell him. I did it right there in my bed. So they killed the bullocks, and the priest received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the he goats for the sin offering before the king. And the congregation, and they laid their hands upon them. And the priests killed them, and they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. For the kingdom, well, for the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. Now you cannot do that today. First of all, we don't bring in lambs, rams, and uh, Lambs, rams, and goats. We don't bring those in. We do the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot pray for the sin of someone else. Now, you can pray if they have sin and you know about You can pray that the Lord will reveal it to them. But you cannot pray for the cleansing. America, with its revival, you can't say, I don't, I don't believe this is what a lot of people think, but you can't say with the revival in America that all the sins of America be you know, put on. No, that's not, that's not how it works. It's an individual today. It's not a corporation. The Old Testament is a corporation, a body of people. Today, it's individuals. Listen, you, you may get your church right. You may get the people in your church right. And there may be sweet fellowship, and God will bless it. Amen. Glory to God. The guy down the street is going to still sell his booze. The corner convenience store is going to still sell cigarettes. That woman will still get her baby aborted. 
the government of America will still continue to lie to you. And there'll be still people in your church are going to sin. And we're gonna have nothing to do with it. I believe the only revival that, that is going to happen today is an individual revival and maybe his family. I believe that. And he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, and with harps, according to the commandment of David. Now David commanded and set up the singing. That was not in the book of the law of Moses. David went one step further, and look, God allowed him. You got the law of Moses now, and you've got the, uh, if I can say, the orchestra of David. Find me where it says in the book of the law about getting up in psalteries and harps and cymbals and setting men up just to sing before the Lord. Can you imagine six now Bible times at six o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night? Can you imagine from six a.m. their time to six p.m. their time. Can you imagine just hearing the trumpets, the cymbals, and the singing of the glory of the Lord. We get that in America today. Twenty-four hours you get music, and it ain't had nothing to do with God. Even in the churches, a lot of it ain't nothing to do with God. And of Gad the king's seer, and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Gad, Nathan, guided David on what the Lord wanted David to do and how to do it. In other words, there may have been some ideas that David had, and God spoke to Nathan, and Gad said, uh, no. Like he did with it. I want to build a house for the Lord. And Gad said, yeah, go ahead. And the Lord said, Gad, you need to go tell him, no, he can't. Okay, Lord. And David replied, hey, I want to do this. And God woke in. Lord heard it. Lord approved of what you want to do. Go ahead and do it. And David said, yeah, I think I should do this. And maybe Nathan come in and say, no, don't do that. Okay. So David did not act as an individual. I'm the king. I'm going to do what I want to do. No, he sought the, the prophets and the seers that were of God. He asked them for counsel. Would this be approved of God? So there's what? There's Gad and Nathan mentioned. So he sought the witness of two in his life to do anything before God. He never did anything on a whim. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Now the trumpets are in the law. I think they were trumpets of silver. And they were different callings. You know, for battle, for assembly. And there was a time of rejoicing. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. That's exactly what the law says to do. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets. Well, what would that burnt offering be? That would be that first lamb in the morning. As soon as they burn that first lamb, play the music for the Lord. And we can't even stay in church the afternoon. Imagine having a service on Sunday from 6 in the morning to maybe 6 at night. All day. And we go on the grounds and you know, have our lunch and have our dinners on the grounds. Fellowship with everybody. Sing songs to the Lord all day in the church congregation outside while, you know, while we're eating and talking and having a good fellowship. It'd be kind of hard to sin, you know, when the Lord's music is in the, I mean, the Lord's music, not the contemporary or the worldly garbage. But when you got the Lord's music playing and you got the, you got the Lord's people gathered together and you're right in the fellowship, it'd be kind of hard to sin Sunday afternoon if you've been in, you are in church all day Sunday.
The song of the Lord began with the, with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. Well, look at that. There's instruments ordained for God. And all the congregation worshiped, and the singers sang. And the trumpeters sounded. And all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. What would that be? The lamb that was offered at night. Six in the morning to six at night. Twelve hours every day worshiping the Lord. And when they had made an end of the offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshiped. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the priests commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David, Psalms, David's hymnal, all the songs that David sang. Your, your book of Psalms is your hymnal. Especially the ones that have the title Asaph. When you read the titles of Psalms, Asaph, that was a song of David. Or a, a hymn that was put to music, even if it wasn't of David. And Asaph the seer. See, I'm saying there it is right there, Asaph. Oh, Asaph was a seer. Oh, wait a minute. We have Gad, Nathan, and Asaph. Three. Out of the mouth of two or three it shall be established. David sought Gad and Nathan for what they were going to do with the instruments. David saw Asaph and said, Asaph, you read this, this sheet of music I wrote, this, this poem I wrote, and make sure it's approved of God. What do you think what David had done and Asaph said, no. That that does, does not that's not God approved, okay? What do you think David would have done with that? He got rid of it, burnt it. Today you get a song that's not for, not for God and all about God. It's put into a, a contemporary Christian album. What was it? The 7-Eleven the other day? It got me laughing. Seven words said 11 times. Praise the Lord. 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 That'll be seven ninety nine for that CD. Let's do it again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. One more time. Praise seven, the Lord. Seven, Praise the Lord. Well, I can't go over seven. Nope. We'll just, it's, it's ridiculous. You sing the same thing over and over and over again. That's not praising God. Because what did God say about repetition? You haven't read the scriptures. Show me in the Psalms where it's the same thing over. Okay, there's one Psalm said, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, the goodness of the Lord endures forever. Okay, but there's other words added to that, and then it ends with the goodness of the Lord endures for something like that. And then you know that the trees and rocks praise the Lord. His endures, you know. It's not just, you know, messed up. All right, get back on the real stuff here. And verse 30, 31. 31. Asaph, the, the see in verse 30. And they sang the praises with gladness. I am so tired of singing this same song week after week after week after week. We had this song, blah, 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 blah. God don't enjoy that. Well, if we sing this song and then we get out of here. We just sing it then we get out of here. God don't enjoy that. You know what? There's a lot of times that God does not enjoy me singing. I, I don't like singing. I just, I don't. Maybe it's just because it's not the right songs or whatever it is. It's just. Oh well, Scripture says Scripture. I need to confess it as a sin, and they bowed their heads in worship. And then Hezekiah answered, said, "Now ye have concentrated yourselves unto the Lord. Come near and." bring sacrifices and thank you offerings in the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thanks, thank offerings. As many as were of the free heart brought offerings. Look at that. Well, we just brought our sin offering. What more do you want? We brought our tithes. Gross. After taxes. Now you want me to give an offering? 
Wow. All the church wants is money, 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 money. Now the thank offerings is your offerings. It's, hey, listen, Lord. Your tithes are what, is what God expects you. And the thank you offer, Lord, listen, you know what? You just, all you want is 10%. That's it. You deserve more. Heck, I deserve 10%. You need, I mean, not need. You desire, I'm not desire. You, your blessings should get the 90%. But God allows us to keep the 90, and he, he inquires the 10%. Well, you're not going to give more? You're not going to support missionaries, help other Christians, you know, pay the, you know, the church bills? It's a thank offering. And the number of the burnt offerings which the congregation brought, now look at this, God's recording it. Three score and ten bullocks. Can you imagine if you got to heaven, God said, you gave $5,010 bills in your lifetime. All right? And three score and ten bullets. You brought to the church 16 bags of oranges from your tree. And each 16 bags had, this bag had this amount, this bag had this amount, this bag had this amount. And a hundred lambs, uh, you spent... 322 hours of raking the church lawn. And 200 lambs. You brought 32 potluck dinner dishes to the potluck fellowships. And 200 lambs. You gave $7 to help other saints who needed help. And all uh, all these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated things were 600 oxen. I mean, should I just go on the things you're supposed to give God? And God records. And 3,000 sheep. I mean, God recorded it. God's telling the numbers. It's written down. We can read them. They're going to be read in heaven. How many times did you pray for that person in, in your in your lifetime in the church for that one person or that one family? How many times did you pray for them when they needed prayer? How many times did you help a fellow Christian who was down and out? How many work parties did you show up for? How much $10 bills, $5 bills, how much did you give? How many submissionaries did you support? Did you ask me about supporting that missionary? If I approve of him. Did you ask me about that? Now there's going to be some things that Christians are going to give money to. And God has nothing involved in it. And it's not going to be, be recorded for glory. I can guarantee now. If he ever did. He's not ever going to record for you. Any money given to the Boy Scouts. Guarantee. If you continue to write, I'm not saying God, you know, proved to the Boy Scouts. I'm just saying. And they're standing where they are today. But the priests were too few. That's today. So that they could not flay all the burnt offerings. That's cutting away to me. Wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them. Now, Re Re Levites. All priests are Levites, but all Levites are not priests. Here now is a special clause. They're calling in the Levites to help do the priestly work, which they were not allowed to do. Till the work was ended, until the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. There were priests still being sanctified. The Levites were on fire. Now, hey, Lord, you know, they need help. Would you mind us if we stepped in and helped at this one cause? But they didn't step in without God's approval. Because had they stepped in without God's approval, you know what would happen to the Levites. They'd be toast themselves with little smoking piles of, of ash. You know God approved of this. Because he records their heart was on fire. Yay! And the priests weren't ready yet. I mean, the thing's always said, I mean, I'm starting for the ministry to be a pastor. And all that. 
If you ever want to have a heart attack or give your pastor a heart attack, have everybody from church call him up and say, come Wednesday night in the prayer meeting. And have everyone at church on a Wednesday night or Thursday if it's your church. That will give a pastor a heart attack if everybody showed up in a midweek service. Because a lot of midweek services are done, gone, departed. Have everyone show up for visitation with the right heart to go knocking on doors or on the street ministry. That get a pastor's heart going. You need to get 911. And also the burn offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burn offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. It was like, boom! Everybody's now on fire for the Lord instantly. That's a revival. Everyone's bringing their offerings. There are so many offerings that priests couldn't even keep up. The priests weren't even ready yet. You say, how do you, well, what could be the church today? You go to church and you're ready to sing before you even start the piano playing. You're singing for the Lord. And the priest walks in, what's going on in there? Man, they're just on fire. They're singing for the Lord. And, and the, the, the collection plates are already filled with money even before we collected them. Well, I haven't even preached a message yet. Can't wait till you do preach that message. They're on fire right now. Just imagine what your message is going to do. It better not be bad, but just better think. That's a revival. That's being on fire. That's cleaning yourself. Getting everything out of your life that God does not approve of, which he calls filth. How do I know it's filth? You better check the Bible. Too many Christians are calling filth Christian and putting a Jesus label on it and think they can get away with it. And then everything that rules your life, after you cleaned up your life, everything by the blood of Jesus Christ, you get those things that's ruining your life. Then you bring back the sin offerings. Then you bring back the thank offering. Then you get all the vessels that, that you told God that you had given to him. That means your whole body. When you've given yourself to God. And then you're so on fire to the Lord. You're singing praise in God. And you got offers even before church starts. You wake up and it's Sunday morning. Yay! All right. Let's go. Can't wait to see what the... You know, it's not what God's going to do for me in church. I can't, you know, I can't stand that. It's what can God do... What can I can do for God to be a blessing to somebody else? Listen, I used to think, you know, if you weren't in church on Saturday, Sunday night, and in the midweek, sir, you know, you're fine. I'm, I'm thankful there's somebody sitting in the pew Sunday morning. Because if no one sat in the pew Sunday morning, the preacher get up there, there'd be no one to preach to. I've sat in, in, with only four people, two, at, well, three at one time. Only three people there for my message that I worked on all week. I've been at prison where I worked on this message and got there. And because, you know, shut down the area and, and the guard and whatever, all the stuff like that, there was only five men there present one night. Only five. And we had the best darn meeting of all the meetings that I've ever had there. Outside of John getting saved one night. Listen. You're there to hear. A lot better than no one. But get yourself on fire for the Lord. Stop being cold. Stop being lukewarm. Get on fire. Be hot for the Lord. Clean up your life by the blood of Jesus. And only by the blood of Jesus. And give it all to God. So you know what people are afraid of? When you give it all to God, God's going to take it. That closes that one.